Welcome to the AT&T Performing Arts Center. I'm Chris Heimbaugh, I'm Vice President of External Affairs here, and I want to thank you all for joining us for a very special Pi Day panel discussion where uh, we're all going to learn about the many ways that STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, are used in the Dallas Arts District. So I uh, want to thank our great panelists here today because they're the ones who are going to share all their wisdom on that. And I uh, want to thank our partner, TalkSTEM. This is the third year that we have been able to host uh, the Pi Day Math Festival here at the AT&T Performing Arts Center. So we are thrilled about that partnership. Um, I want to introduce today's moderator, KER anchor, KERA anchor and a journalist, Sam Baker. Sam, uh, who's from Beaumont, Texas, by the way, he is KERA's senior editor and local host for Morning Edition. I listen to him every morning. And if you listen to KERA, you'll also recognize his special vital signs reports. He has won an Emmy Award and has been honored by the Associated Press and Public Radio News Directors. So please join me in welcoming Sam and all our panel. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Okay. So the next trick is to see if I can live up to all of that. Mm -hmm. um, we'll see here. Um, first of all, I'm curious about something. I've seen a few of you with it. The little, what is that? What is that? Wait a minute, I'm curious. <laughs> okay, say it again. You uh, put this on your finger and you try to balance it. Okay. Watch, it won't work for me. I'm sure. Wait, I know it won't work because I have. Let me see. Oh, see? <laughs> Almost. You wait, stand up. You do it. Turn this way. Pressure's on. Uh, yeah, I think I need to put more putty on the sides. Oh, oh, oh did you make this? Oh, you, oh, okay, so you guys made this. There we go. I think they both deserve a round of applause because the first one figured out what, how to fix it. Yes, there, there it yep. is, right there. All righty, well that said, let's see if we can get on and live up to that. Um, we've got this wonderful panel of great people who are going to tell you how STEM and the arts come together or can come together. And we've got a limited amount of time, so I'm gonna go right into this and introduce them. Kimberly Wagner is director of the Gems and Minerals Center of Excellence at the Perot Museum of Nature and Science. Fran Boss, Associate Conservator, Dallas Museum of Art. Uh, Jamie Allen um, works with or in education uh, for Dallas Symphony Orchestra. Do I have the correct? Okay. Yep. Lamar Livingston is Technical Director of Stage Operations for the Meyerson Symphony Center. Lee Arnold is Assistant Curator, Nasher Sculpture Center. Christian Roberts, uh, works in education, also a vocalist, Dallas Opera, and Nicole Ray, see I got it right, uh, Dallas Black Dance Theater uh, Encore Director? Yes. Okay, and choreographer as well. <clears throat> All right, so let's get started. I'll just throw out this question and each one of you um, can answer here. But I mean, in general, do we even begin to realize how art and STEM interact together? We'll start with you, Kimberly. So this is the Aurora Butterfly of Peace, and it's currently on display at the Perot Museum, and that's where I work, in the Gems and Minerals Hall. And so I think this is an excellent example of like kind of a fusion of art and science. So this is actually created using 240 natural colored diamonds. And it took the um, owner and creator, who is Alan Bronstein, over 12 years to put this together. Wow. And yeah. And so I think this shows, like this, he considers this to be a piece of art and it has symbolism behind it, kind of representing the butterfly and peace and humanity, as well as using diamonds, which come, these diamonds come from nearly all of the continents. Um, and I think also too that we have shown here is what I'm doing is this is, I'm shining a UV flashlight on this because some of the diamonds actually fluoresce. So we actually have it in a case where you can, it goes from daylight to UV light showing that glowing fluorescence. 
But um, that, for me, is kind of a very great example of how art and science can come together and within the Gems and Minerals Hall. Cool. Friend. I'm the associate conservator at the DMA, and my job is, I think, the perfect marriage between art and science, the visual arts and okay. science. Um, I'm kind of the art doctor. And so art conservation has three components, art history, studio arts, and chemistry. And we have to be able to be proficient in each of those areas to take care of the works of art. Here I am being the doctor for our sculptures um, on these slides here. Let's go to the next slide. Um, conservators take care of our history uh, through um, the arts. Um, my particular role is sculptures. And um, when you think about an art doctor, it's, it's not just the hand skills that's needed, but the science background. We need to be able to use the scientific method to investigate issues so we can preserve these, these pieces for the future. Let's go to the next slide. So we have to be proficient in the arts because we have to take care of um, the works. We have to understand how the artist made the pieces. But we also have to be able to jump into the scientific realm so we can help the curators understand the pieces better mm -hmm. or how to better take care of the pieces. Jamie. So what a lot of people don't realize is uh, in ancient Greece, both astronomy and music were thought of as two sides of the same coin where astronomy was how external objects align and how one relates to those external objects, whereas music was the science of internal objects and how those align. So ever since ancient days, music has been considered an, a science. Um, and that continues to today. Um, and, and we can see it in very specific ways just in terms of the idea of vibration and alignment. Of course, you couldn't hear my voice unless there were vibrations happening. Um, from my larynx to your eardrums and all the space in between. Um, and so there's a lot of science that goes into that. Um, and then the magic is where the art and the science combine. So for instance, this violin, uh, this has been chosen, this has been built out of very specific kinds of woods for their acoustic properties. We've got spruce on the top and maple around the bottom. Um, and different kind of woods for the fingerboard and that sort of thing. All of that chosen very specifically for their acoustic properties. Um, the, uh, and what, there's a lot of uh, biology involved too. What a lot of people don't realize is that a, a bow, a violin bow, this part of right here is actually made out of horse hair. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and why, you might ask, is this made out of horse hair? What a random idea. Well, it turns out that if you look at this, these are from, from si si the tails of Siberian horses. Um, if you look at the, the tails under a microscope, it's got all these tiny little barbs on it. It's like little fish hooks all along the hair. And so what that does is it grabs the string. So it's like me plucking the violin, but if I broke, draw the bow across the violin, you, it's plucking it a million times just in one bow string. So there's a lot of biology as well as science that goes into this kind of thing. Uh, the shape is very important. Uh, Lamar will probably talk a little bit about that when it gets to buildings, the shape of buildings and their acoustic properties. My name is Lamar Livingston. I work with the uh, Meyerson Symphony Center next door. In fact, with Jamie, Dallas Symphony is our primary tenant there. I work with the technical staff. There are four of us who work behind the scenes to operate all the sound, lighting, video, and the movable acoustics of the room so we can actually change how the, the sounds will act in the room, the sound waves. Uh, of course, science is involved because the equipment that we're using was designed by scientists engineers. Uh, some of it is for safety. Um, if we're 
putting equipment, uh, plugging it into a wall outlet for electricity, electricity can be lethal, and we uh, have to do calculations to make sure that we don't overload the circuit. And there, there's uh, uh, actually an equation where watts equals voltage times amps, and we do a little calculation. If we know two of those values, we can uh, figure out how many lights we can put on that circuit before we trip it out and, and trip the breaker. So that's important because it protects the equipment. If you look at that, that picture, you can see the stage uh, down there where the piano is. And then behind that, there's a coral terrace where the choir would sit. And then there's this organ. Well, right above the organ is the canopy. There are four acoustical canopies above the stage that we can move up or down and we can tilt. It looks like a spaceship. Kind of looks like the uh, Millennial Falcon from uh, <laughs> Star Wars. We can tilt that cool. and yeah. what that does for us is uh, acoustically it reflects the sound from the stage, from the performers, uh, back to the stage so that we can hear ourselves and one another on the stage. And it also bounces those sound waves out to the audience and you can see where the seating is. Those walls on the side, those are the parallel walls in the concert hall. Those are very, very important on how they're placed. You don't want them any wider than, say, 72 to 84 feet. Uh, there's magic in the numbers of sound waves. The, the direct sound from the stage arrives at the listener's ears. And then the early reflections off of these walls arrive at almost the same time as the, the direct sound, so you end up being impacted with a very strong sound image. And that's why the, the Meyerson acoustics works so well. On top of that, that gives you the clarity and the intimacy of the room. At the top, you see those uh, windows on the left and right at the very top there? That is another room. That's called the reverberation chamber. There are doors there that open and close to allow the sound from the orchestra to enter that big room and it gives you this long reverberation. Now don't, don't confuse reverberation with, de with uh, delay, I mean, excuse me, with uh, uh, echo. echo. People think echo is what you're talking about, but uh, it's lots of scattered echoes. Echo is if you're in the mountains and, or, or between a bunch of buildings and you say, hello, hello, hello. That's an echo that's very distinct. Reverb, reverberation is hello, and it's this really beautiful sound that enhances the music. And we can open and close the doors to have either a very short or medium reverb time or we can open the doors in a way that allows the sound to last for a very long time. We have 95 full-time musicians in the Dallas Symphony Orchestra. We consider the building itself, the hall, to be one of the other instruments because it is so finely tunable and it makes a huge difference in the way a concert sounds. And in fact, uh, those people that, have, uh, that, that listen to recordings of orchestras uh, quite a lot are usually able to pick out a Dallas Symphony Orchestra recording because of the nature of the sound of this building. Um, it's, it's that specific. Well, Thank another you. institution that's certainly highly revered, Nasher Sculpture Center. Lee Arnold. So uh, I'm assistant curator at the Nasher Sculpture Center, an art museum dedicated to modern contemporary sculpture. So like Fran, I work with sculpture on a daily basis. Unlike Fran, I chose to go into art history to avoid uh, studying math and science. <laughs> <laughs> I thought by studying the arts, I would escape uh, you know, dealing with math and science on a regular basis, which weren't my strong suits. Um, <clears throat> but I think that it's working at the Nasher has shown me how that's fairly unavoidable. Uh, everything we do at the Nasher involves, um, from the placement, the care, uh, education of sculpture, involves some component of STEM. And today I just wanted to talk to you about something that I do on a fairly regular basis, which is to try to understand scale. Um, scale of our building and scale of the objects that we install. Um, sculpture can be very heavy and difficult to move. So to help our handlers, our art handlers out, 
um, by not asking them to move things too often <laughs> or um, you know, too frequently, we like to play within our um, scale model of the Nasher Sculpture Center building, which was made when our architects designed the building. They also gave us this beautiful gift, which I refer to in a very scientific way as our dollhouse. It is a scale model, which uh, means that it is much smaller uh, than the Nasher. It is about a half an inch to one foot. So when we're working in the model, we also have to make to scale objects to represent the art that we plan to install. And this is where the math comes in. And um, yeah, I kind of hoped I wouldn't have to do math, but I, I do. And in fact, now it's become second nature. But on the left side of the screen, you'll see the, an image of our scale model. And uh, they're kind of rudimentary um, to scale models of artworks. In the foreground, there's an Anthony Caro sculpture, which is quite enormous when you see it in person, um, and various other sculptures kind of scattered throughout our model. And then on the right-hand side, you get to see what that model translated it into, into our national galleries. So what it comes down to is essentially taking, uh, using math to transcribe the dimensions of an object into a, a scale that fits within our model so that we can look at the image on the left and understand how does this enormous Anthony Caro play well with these other small sculptures? Will it be too large? Will uh, the position of it take up too much room? How will our bodies respond to it in space? And that's something that I take the calculations, whittle it down to half an inch to one foot, um, do this really great kind of construction project where I get to use glue and scissors and it's very, it takes you back to when you're in elementary school really. And you get to make these little two scale models which become these little, um, they're you know, no larger than this maybe, uh, that we get to situate in our model. And it's really a helpful way uh, as a, an art curator, as someone trying to understand Will this installation make sense when we get up into the gallery, when I'm asking the art handler to move a 500 pound sculpture? I really only want them to have to do that once. So <laughs> laying these works out in a scale model is really helpful and it's really a way on a daily basis that I am working directly within the STEM practice. Okay. Uh, Christian Roberts with uh, Dallas Opera. We heard a lot from Jamie about how science works with music. Is it the same for, well, with, instru with instruments anyway, um, is it the same for the voice? It is. Um, the voice is, what well, we say it's the instrument, the only instrument that was created directly by God. We always joke about that. But it's because um, it, some of the things that Jamie was talking about, uh, vibrations, whenever you speak, whenever you sing, you're allowing air to go over your vocal folds and it brings the vocal folds together and you get a sound. So everybody try something for me. Can everybody go, uh, Now move more air, just go, uh, You notice how when you move more air and the pitches went up, that's how it does it. So we call that vocal fry in the beginning where you go, uh, You're moving very little air. But then when you move more air, uh, does that make sense? Am I making sense? So that's called the Bernoulli effect. So when the vocal folds come together with air in between them, and that's the, one of the basic ways that I use my voice um, when I'm on stage. Um, as How far large as are those vocal folds, I'm sorry to interrupt. Hmm? How large are, are those vocal folds? It depends on the person. So it can any, be anywhere. So when you're little, of course, you're waiting for your voice to, to, to grow up, right? But really, you're taking things that are this long, like this long, and whenever you do a really large sound like that, they stretch just a little bit. So they're not, they're not big at all. And so that's the reason why I say your entire body is your instrument, because when you are singing, you are essentially taking the smallest group of muscles. You know, the, I won't get into the larynx and... I'm not trying to put everybody to sleep, but whenever you do that, the simplest way that I can say it is the more air you're moving, Okay, the more you move through, the more solid the sound. So when you go, uh, and then you move more air through, uh, sorry. <laughs> Opera singers don't use microphones either, by the way. So when you hear them on stage uh, over an orchestra, you know, know that the hall, especially the Windspear, is built um, specifically for opera, so the acoustics were built for that, but we also train our voices to get over an orchestra. 
Um, so there's a lot of science, and a lot of it's biological, it's um, anatomy, it's physiology, um, but there's also just basic science and the Bernoulli effect. You know when you, um, you know how an airplane stays in the air? The air is moving over its wings. That's essentially what's happening on your, on your vocal cords or your vocal folds, if you want to call them that. Um, the other way that we use math is the simplest thing on the planet. It's one of the first things that you do as a kid. What do you learn, how, what do you learn how to do when you're a kid? You use your fingers for it. You can say it loud, counting. And Jamie can attest to this, and Mark can attest to this. Nicole can attest to this. Counting is very important in the, in, in the arts, particularly in opera, because uh, anybody in choir in here? Band? So when I do this, what do you do? One, two, three, four, right? That's a four pattern, right? And you know to watch the conductor, the director, right, to do that. So everybody watch me, let's do that again. One is here. One, two, three, Four. Everybody do it with me now? One, two, three, four. So every, that is a language that every musician, every singer, instrumentalist, vocalist, dancer, we all know those, that language. Because that's the thing that brings it all together. And I often joke and I say, you know, this is, this is the Labo M score. It's one of the operas we have going on, uh, opening tomorrow. And we take this book, and we have to bring it off the paper. So we take it from page to stage. And so when you get it, can you bring up uh, slide 16, please, and pause it just for a second. Um, eventually, everybody on the stage has to be counting. They're using their voices just like I told you. They're in the pit with Jamie, and they have a conductor in front of them. And they've prepped to do that, right? So we have a combination of all the arts, right? We have visual arts with our costume set, costumes and set designs, makeup. Uh, performing arts, of course, with dance, choreography, singing, acting, all right? And so when we bring them all together, this becomes something that looks like this. Oh, and in another language, that's Italian. So you have your soloists that are singing. And then you have a marching band, so... You have kids, by the way, so if you think you're a kid and can't be in an opera course, I got another. I got more information for you. So how important do you think counting is with that many people on stage, singing in another language, in a costume, on different levels, into an opera house that sees 2,200 and none of us have microphones? Uh, we've talked a lot about, about uh, how STEM interacts with uh, various aspects of, of arts. What is it for dance? It, it encompasses almost everything that everyone has talked about before me. Um, so you take all of those things and you're moving your body through space and time. And as a choreographer, calculating how a dancer moves their body through space and time along with other dancers can be very difficult, but math is what keeps us together. We count constantly, and then you have wonderful pieces of music that have all of these different tempos, and in a dancer's head, we're thinking about, okay, we're keeping in line with the people that we're dancing with, but we're also thinking about where we are in space at the same time, and also what our body is doing at the same time. So our brain is all over the place and we try our very best to make it seem like we're in tune with the intent of what the work is about and that you don't see all of what's going on in our head. We don't let it read out. But in terms of creating choreography, when I listen to a piece of music, I have to chart it first. And when I chart music, I'm, I'm not a musician by any stretch, but I did have to take a music for dancers class in, in school so that I can understand the basic fundamentals. So I chart music, and when I chart the music, it tells me, well, I create as I'm doing it. I, I decide this is where I want something to happen physically. I want this to happen here, and I want this to happen over here, and this to happen here. So that way I can create inflections of the body to go with inflections of the music. And if I don't have a true understanding of 
how the music sounds, I cannot convey that to the dancers. But in order to keep all of the dancers together, we have to count, we have to use numbers. And a dancer counts a little bit differently than, say, a musician, perhaps. <laughs> so, in our head, we, we count in fours and eights. Eight is, our, eight is our number, right? And in some dance techniques, we go past the number eight. So if I'm asking you to go one, two, on three, and four, on five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, then on 13. In a dancer's mind, that's like, wait a minute. We only go up to eight. <laughs> so, and I've had choreographers to choreograph on me who count up to 30. And in my head, I have to keep track of every movement on those counts up to 30. My mind is going. And I had to learn how to do this younger on. And it took practice, and it made me become very in tune with, one, my body, also spatially what's happening with the people around me. Um, and so I could calculate, I learned to calculate very quickly in my brain. Now, not a mathematician by any means, but dance made me think of numbers very differently. Um, and then there's also the degrees that we use with our bodies. We create these degrees, and I'm gonna, if you can't hear me, please let me know. I, I have a big voice, but um, I'm gonna step away from the mic so I can show you some things. So when using the body, we think about different degrees, degrees of how we hold our arms, how we move through space, and what is the force that is needed to move through the space within the timing of the music and the energy. Because if I did something like such, you feel a certain way. If I do something like such, you feel a certain way. So it's about energy, power, torque, suspension, gravity. There's so many different elements that go into how we physically move our body that is connected with, excuse me, connected with math and physics and so, as a dancer, say we are to do a pirouette. Anybody, pirouette. Have we, we've heard the word, maybe. <laughs> so a pirouette is a particular type of turn. So in doing a pirouette, I have to balance my body. I have to square off or find the degree in which I use my arms or portable that take me through space as I turn. Then I also have to think about my energy going up and down at the same time to be on my axis to actually make the turn. Then I also have to find a point in space to stay on my axis. So we think about all of these things at the same time. So, if my angles are off, and if my weight isn't placed properly, I will not be successful in my pirouette. So, I have to shift forward, make sure that my angle is correct, 90 degree angle, 90 degrees, so that I don't have to wind all of this up to turn. But I'm here and go straight up and I use a spot to stay on my axis. In heels. <laughs> <laughs> so, there's a lot of calculation that goes into it. And so a dancer has to be able to determine how they have to use their body through space and time because we're all made differently. Seemingly the same, but there, we have different different things. I may have more range of motion in my hips than another. So someone else would have to figure out, okay, how do I achieve the same degrees with the body that I have? And so 
in creating choreography, I also think about geometry and how I cross-section things, how I want the pattern to look to the audience, and also how it makes me feel. How I demonstrate something through, as I did with this port bra it makes you feel a certain way. And as a performing art, it's about all of us coming together as humans and what we have in common is how we can feel. If there is one thing you'd like everyone, <clears throat> excuse me, one thing you'd like everyone to leave here with in terms of thinking about STEM and the arts, what would it be, Kimberly? Um, I think that I would say just be open-minded um, in just terms of the classes that you take and the things like lessons and things that are out there. Um, that's, I found in my own career, that's, um, what got me to where I am today is you that you didn't start it, off with gems and minerals, really. No. <laughs> <laughs> international affairs. International, international affairs was actually my uh, major in college, and then about a year into it, I realized that's not what I wanted to do. And I was in a jewelry store looking at some jewelry pieces and went, "Oh wow, that's really interesting. Like, I wonder how you get into that." And so talked to a bunch of people and found out that they all recommended, oh, finish your four-year degree first, but then go to the Gemological Institute of America and get your graduate gemologist certificate. So I ended up finishing my four-year degree, but took classes in earth sciences. So that's why I say just be kind of open-minded to the things that are out there, and you'll be amazed at like what, um, what you use later on in life and takes you along your path. So. Friend. I'd say embrace your curious mind and also, like you just mentioned, take a bunch of classes and everything. It will definitely benefit you in the future. I've enjoyed everything from polymer chemistry to glass blowing. Um, it all has come together in my current profession, but embrace your curious mind and your imagination. Jamie. Uh, I would just say, sort of piggybacking on some things that Christian and Nicole mentioned, is that where STEM and the arts meet, that's where the magic happens, because our bodies are, as Nicole and Christian demonstrated really well, our bodies are instruments as well, and that's where we're really building on the feeling. So we have to take all these technical vibrations that these, these tools are creating, um, and then we find where, where, how that makes us feel, and then we can, we have a conversation with those tools that create the art. And if you're really true to that conversation, you're really feeling that vibration, and you understand that 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 interaction back and forth. That's where the magic really happens. So it's 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 a, it's an amazing place to be. Lamar. As a technician, if you wanted to pursue a career uh, in technical theater you would be working with the artist to support what they're doing, where their uh, art meets science, by using the uh, physical tools of sound and lighting and the immovable acoustics and video and rigging that I was talking about to support the, the show. You could also pursue a career in uh, acoustical design, which uh, I was touching on just a little bit. I noticed in looking for websites on what everyone was doing, <clears throat> no shortage of women in museums, in dance, in opera. Are there a great many women in stage operations? Oh, absolutely, no? yes. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of uh, men and women who are doing uh, technical theater work uh, on stage and behind the scenes. Lee. I would just say, um, don't do the route I did, which is avoid STEM. <laughs> I think there is no avoiding it. And what I've learned um, so far in my career, you know, when I was growing up, it was very much you were in the arts or you were in STEM. And I'm really happy that STEAM is now being embraced by education um, today. But I think what I've learned in my career is how much we're relying upon each other. You know, we couldn't install works of art in our museum without the help of engineers. Um, I, for an example, we installed two summers ago sculptures, eight of which individual sculptures weighed three tons each. Uh, if you've been to the Nasher, you know that our main galleries, there are offices beneath it. So a lot of our staff were thinking, are these gonna just fall through the floor? <laughs> Are they going to crush us? And so it became a conversation, and we worked out a plan in 
you know, in conjunction with an engineer. We relied on the specialty of engineers to help us ensure that those sculptures were safely installed and um, didn't fall through the floor. On the flip side, um, Christian made a really interesting comment before we even started the panel, which was it's really come down to creative thinkers to come up with solutions. So while um, STEM practitioners, scientists, mathematicians, um, technologists, really come up with practical solutions and they use their expertise to do so, it's when they combine that expertise with the minds, creative minds um, of those involved in the arts where the magic happens, which I think has been said already. So I would just advise everyone to, again, keep an open mind. I think that's already been said. And understand that um, there's no need to really separate yourself into one or the other. You can be all. You can be both. You can be everything. Christian. Um, I, I just want to piggyback off of that. Um, I think, I, I always say it takes all kinds, um, even in admin work and being, on the, being in the offices doing this. So I'm a singer, but I also am an educator um, who also has to deal with budgets and spreadsheets and, <laughs> I'm sorry, um, <laughs> but it's a skill that I had to acquire. So I will say when we talk about practical uses of math, practical uses of science, know that it's going to come up. There's no avoiding it. So it takes all kinds of people to make this these art forms happen, okay? And it takes all kinds of science, all kinds of everything. Just a little short note, the, um, actually, opera as an art form was started by a group called the Florentine Camerata in the late 1500s, and they had all kinds on there. There wasn't just artists, dancers, musicians. There were also scientists and uh, mathematicians, philosophers, and, you know, we don't know exactly all who sat on that particular panel, but we do know that um, it's rumored that Galileo's father actually was one of those members. So when I tell you that it takes all kinds, it really, really does. Nicole Ray, get the last word. All right. So ditto on what everyone has said, but creativity. Dance has allowed my brain to be so creative. Um, and not just creative in, for the stage, but creative in my everyday life. Problem solving. Being able to solve problems. We're gonna all have them, right? How we decide what to do about those problems is what's really important. And I have learned through art, through math, how to solve problems. I've also learned how to analyze as a choreographer and director, analyzing why this person moves this way and how can I get them to move that way. So all of those things come into play. I'd like to thank Michael Ray, Dallas Black Dance Theater, the encore director and choreographer, Christian Roberts, uh, works in education. She's also a vocalist with Dallas Opera. Lee Arnold is assistant curator with the Nasher Sculpture Center. Lamar Livingston is the technical director of stage operations for the Meyerson Symphony Center. Jamie Allen uh, works in education with the Dallas Symphony Orchestra. Fran Boss is associate conservator with Dallas Museum of Art. And Kimberly Wagner is director of the Gems and Minerals Center of Excellence with the Perot Museum of nature and science. Would you give this panel a <laughs>